Why, Stuart? I suppose basically, why, why have you done this? Well, over the years, as an E-list celebrity, you get asked to write newspaper columns, mm -hmm. which is unfair, because obviously you're principally being asked because they think, oh, you're a bit known, so it might drive sure. some traffic through. Yeah. And if you're any good, that's a bonus, yeah. right? And then about five or six years ago, I suddenly had a bit of a breakthrough on how to do them, which was, in my mind, I thought, I'll try and write as if I'm trying to get sacked, as if this is the last <laughs> column you'd be asked to do. And I also realised, a bit like I'd done with the stand-up, that to be some sort of separation between the columnist voice and sort of, uh, um, you know, who, who you were. And the columnist had to be someone who had to knock these things out, also wanted to give a good account of himself in some way. Um, and I'll tell you what I was thinking of on some level, I didn't really realise until after it was done. But, you know, y years ago, I, I'd read some Arthur Macken, and you actually enrolled me in the Arthur Macken Society. And there's an interesting thing with Arthur Macken, the Welsh writer of late, late 19th, early 20th century, that as well as writing these epics, mystical books, and doing his own things that he really cared about, he also knocked out loads of columns for magazines. And, and know, he also, and sort of, Arthur Macken, he also published, I think, a slim volume of his own bad reviews. Did he? I didn't know that. I believe really? so. So oh, right, your, right. your career is, is echoing <laughs> that of, of Arthur Macken in, in many ways. But yeah, well, and, and dying in sort of forgotten obscurity. <laughs> <laughs> the century is yet young. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the title content provider, Yeah. I mean, like, this was a, a term that I, I noticed myself um, a, a few years ago, and it, it kind of seems to be implying that the relationship between the artist and the art yeah. is kind of like the relationship between pig lips and, and sausages. Yeah, absolutely. Well I, well, I first noticed it. I, got, I was appearing at the Kilkenny Comedy Festival about 10 years ago, and I got a, um, a text on my phone out of nowhere asking me if it said, hello, we are a digital content provider, and we wondered if you'd be prepared to provide content for various media off the back of your um, appearance at Kilkenny. And I couldn't even understand what it was. <laughs> and I, what I worked out was they wanted me to give them a bit of film of me doing something that could then be put on mobile phones and things. And, I, and they, uh, they described me primarily as a content provider, which I, obviously I didn't do it, because I felt so bruised by the idea of that. But then um, Henning Venn, the German comedian, is very funny. He's more than that. I mean, he's a comedian in his own right, but he's principally a German comedian. He, he's, so he, he used to work in football marketing, and he's very funny. He talks about we're content providers and we have to drive around the country delivering our product to different customer bases. And he <laughs> reduces the whole process of being a writer or a comedian into this sort of, you know, and I'm call, so calling it content provider. It's sort of saying these were done for this purpose. Yeah, but it, what could what fun could you have with them? I, you know? I think that it's it's a hurtful term, but it's probably accurate. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. I mean, at least in in culture generally, I think yeah. that sort of uh, yeah, content provider will probably do. Yeah, well, in yeah. a way, you know, we're encouraged, aren't we, to spend a lot of time thinking, talking about, oh, you know, what did you mean by this? Why did you do it? Well, with these, it's because. Uh, on the Wednesday, they would ask me, what are you writing about? And I had to file them by Friday morning. <laughs> and then I thought, there's the parameters. It's, it's 1,100 words. What can you do with it? Well, and that's the fun of it, which is probably something you've had with, with yeah. superhero strips, is people know what the rules are. So how can you mess around with it and still, on some level, deliver something that's supposedly a newspaper column, but you've messed about well, with it? Well, I would say that probably there's a good case to be made for saying that any kind of genre or yeah. any kind of form, it's never more interesting than when you're kind of breaking it in some way or dismantling it. Yeah. You know, that's what they're for, really. Yeah. I think forms and genres, yeah. they're, they're there to be pulverised. Well, I suppose there's a set of expectations about what a newspaper column is that you either confirm or deny. One of the ways you deny them is by making up things that aren't true and writing a thing that reads a bit more like a short story, or by expressing an absolutely un unsubstantiated, uh, you know, an opinion for, which is groundless, or, you know, sort of, sort of mess around with it, and also not really writing as yourself, but writing as this other kind of version of it, because the traditional newspaper columnist is 
someone saying what I did this week and this happened to me and whatever, so try and we, mess we, around with it a bit. Clearly a lot of your readers don't understand. Um, well, I'm, I'm just thinking yeah. about the, the Arthur Macken like kind of critical comments yeah. below the line. I mean, some of them I thought were very astute. I mean, I, like, well, I agree with some of them. I mean, uh, I've, I've put the comments in. I, I mean, it, uh, the, the one that I mean, surprised me because I mean, I know quite a lot about the occult, but uh, the person who pointed out, I, I'd always thought that uh, the witch Boy general was Mary Hopkins. <laughs> I, I thought that Matthew Hopkins was the guy who'd done the backing vocals on Sound and Vision. <laughs> I mean, but, just... uh, no, it, this was... Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, some of your audience's comments, um, it's obviously a different audience to your, oh, yeah. your stand-up. Well, that's the fun of it, is it goes out to all these people, and then you sort of... You, you, part of the fun of writing columns for the newspapers, you think people sort of stumble across this in the middle of all this other stuff, and what will they think of it? And um, so, you know, it, it, it's the element of surprise. Also, there's a lot more sort of scatology and stuff about, and sort of <laughs> just filth in these which, than I would do in the stand-up, because I like the idea that on a Sunday morning someone's just stumbled across an article about a yeah. turd that has the face of Tony Blair, and they've read it at nine o'clock in the morning and go, what's that? You know, so it's actually about... You'd expect context. that in a club, uh, yeah. in, a, in a comedy club yeah, yeah. at 11 o'clock at yeah, night, yeah, yeah. but not with uh, your copy of The Observer in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so in a way, I, I do things in these that I think are a bit sort of pathetic, but I think it's funny that they're <laughs> in the newspaper. And the other thing that you can't escape, I mean, I, admi I admire your your... Uh, decision to entirely sort of cut yourself off from from social media, and I've sort of done it a bit, but not quite enough. And what I've found is that you know in newspapers now there's always below the line comments, and in a way, what started to happen was the sheer level of hostility of some of them. I th th I started to write more to become the kind of person that would drive would generate this incomprehensible fury. I mean I. I wrote, and, and one, I, there was a comment from Tim Montgomery, who's a sort of conservative blogger, mm -hmm. saying at the end of one, he wrote about it somewhere and put, the, the Guardian is now beyond parody, because the column was meant as a, as a joke. You know, and, it, and so it's sort of, they, you, you, it, it kind of lands in different places, and so the responses you get from it are, they haven't come to see you in a club, they're not, you know. They're, they're not, not your audience. They're not your audience. So, but on the other hand, you also get people that don't know who you are that really like it, so... I would think that sort of a lot of the the readers posting these comments, particularly the hostile ones, yeah. they Do you think that they're, they're, they're frightened in some way because they have mistaken these pieces for journalism? That, that they actually think, why is this person saying this? It's yeah. like... Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, yeah. sometimes it's like... Um, sometimes telling a joke in front of, say, certain Americans, yeah. um, if you tell it with a straight face, yeah. uh, they will look at you like you're having some kind of schizophrenic breakdown. Yeah. You know, what, why is he talking about chickens yeah. and we, rows? We have to know what, what, con you know what is acceptable context. Like last year, there'd been a big anti-capitalist riot in London. I forgot, forget which, which, uh, where it was and who'd been targeted. But the police were involved in quite a big event. And the next day I was dropping the kids off in school and one of the mums in the playground said to me, oh, you look tired. And I went, well, I was on that riot last night, setting fire to all banks and things, and I have got arrested and it was a long evening. And she went, oh. She went, well, she said, I would be against capitalism, but I have a sort of stake in it, I suppose. I thought, wow, I've kind of like really misjudged this. Because sort of. <laughs> people don't know you, do they? So they don't know... What, what you're saying, you know, and they don't know if that's true or... And it's the same with these, they sort of go out into a vacuum, so in a way it's unfair. Is it that people these days, they, they really need an emoji? Well, to it, actually tell them well, that you're, you're not being I don't know, although serious? to be fair, you know, things have been said, haven't they, in the current American election campaign, in the Brexit campaign, that were much more extreme than things that we used to see in discourse, you know, columns were written in newspapers, like by, you know, usually on the right, to be fair, by Katie Hopkins types, generating uh, opinions supposedly comic on some level that you just never really thought you'd hear. So, I, I mean, I wrote, my, one of my regrets, and I, I left it in, was I, around the time of the Scottish independence debate, I noticed that 
there were a lot of columns written by English columnists saying what they thought the Scots should, should do. do. And they felt they were entitled to opinion because their grand was Scots, or they used to go on holiday there a lot as a kid, you know. And so I wrote a thing saying that because I thought I had a Scottish ancestry, I should be allowed to say, <laughs> you know, what would happen. No, I thought it was so over the top that it was obviously a parody of those sort of comments, but it wasn't. And I actually got the hate mail for that spread out beyond the below the line comments, and people were leaving things for me at theatres. And I didn't really want to upset that. I thought I upset the wrong people by accident. But then they can be forgiven for thinking that because there were loads of columns like that. You know, that's the problem is how do you... OK, what my son, was, who recently learned the word dystopia, was saying to me, how would you write a sort of dystopian fiction as we head towards one? And certainly your dystopias <laughs> seem to have anticipated... You know, yeah. rather more quickly than one might have hoped. Seems yeah, yeah. Fun. well, I mean, that certainly, it wasn't my intention yeah. that things should work out like this. I wasn't <laughs> laying down a blueprint, but it seems that that is what it has been misunderstood mm. as. You know, it's, uh, it's not so much what the story's about, but the very fact of the story's existence <coughs> actually makes you think about the world that you're living in. Yeah. yeah. And whether that could apply or not. Yeah. At the end of the Olympics, there was all this talk about the legacy of the Olympics you know, mm -hmm. and the tragedy is five years down the line I mean that, that whole celebration of Britishness as a sense of the community that was the opening ceremony that's just sh shot to pieces now and um, the uh, it didn't have any uh, effect on encouraging people to do sport didn't um, create greater access to people for sport it, no, so um, but I, I wrote a thing where I basically got all the reports on the legacy of the Olympics and how brilliant it was and changed it to being a discussion about a decomposing cat in my road and all the people standing around looking at it. And I thought it was fairly obvious. And the stain that would endure for, for decades or centuries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But this is what I got from the public. You see, when a supposedly respected, famous, open inverted commas, comedian, they always do that as if inverted putting inverted commas yeah. suggests that you are, right? Yeah. Yeah. such as yourself, resorts to writing about a dead animal on the pavement, pretending it is amused and fascinated community, I can only feel sorry for you. Clearly, the cat should have been removed and not left on the pavement. If you find all this amusing, you are a poor specimen of a human being. You're not big, you're not clever, you're just pathetic. You should decide at some point to grow up, and I wish you luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's unfair, but they, they are um, they are funny. Really, I felt really bad about that column. I wrote that column, and, and I... I hadn't really realised, I, I worry that I'm not really fit to do these because I don't really, I'm aware that I don't really understand the public mood and the Olympics to me I always thought, okay, how long is this going to last, what's going on, why have we done deals with all these dodgy companies, what's Boris trying to get out of it, you know, and after I wrote that column making fun of it, you know, again, my point of contact with the world, school playground at pick up and drop off time. I could see some of the mums that had worked as volunteer guides or whatever, a lot of people did in East London, I could see they were upset with me because they, they, they'd done, they'd worked on something they really believed in and they didn't want to see it compared to a, a decomposing cat and, um, <laughs> you know, I did, I did feel bad about it and, <laughs> you know, but you can't, what can you do? You know, I mean, like, I mean, the weird thing about this is it's, it's accidentally, it accidentally seems more coherent than it is as a collection of columns because it's a collection of columns uh, about people, many of whom have now disappeared from public life, or um, ways of thought which, the ways of thought and values which the power shift, rightly or wrongly, in the exit from, from Europe, will um, relegate, you know, to the back of the line. I mean, ar arguments about what's the point of culture uh, welfare cuts, all these sort of things are just steamrolled along, aren't they, in the bigger thing now, which is how we're going to pay to get out of Europe and who's going to organise it and whatever. All those things are just gone into the into the mill. It seems like a, a you know, to write 1,100 words about the point of public broadcasting kind of seems like this this awful period, 2011 to 2016, that looks like a golden age before we plunged into sort of yeah, well, administrative chaos. How it's going to look, isn't yeah, it, to yeah, the future? It's yeah. going to look like, yeah, you deliberately planned this to mm. sort of um, yeah. 
to, to capture the, yeah. the decline of this pinnacle yeah. of civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah.